What if it rained food? What if Earth was a cube? What if we had nine lives? What if bits could fly? It's absurd. If money grew on trees, if we didn't have these, if we walked through life slightly magnetical, it's absurd. Absurd hypothetical. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Absurd Hypotheticals, the show where we overthink dumb questions so you don't have to. I'm your host, Marcus Lehner, and I'm joined here today by Chris Yee and Ben Storms. Say hi, guys. Hey, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Ben. And uh, I actually, I saw something very, some combination of fascinating, kind of a little bit terrifying on Twitter recently. That's, I mean, that's pretty part of for the course for Twitter. Yeah, that's pretty much just the, you know, how you describe Twitter in general. So I'm going to, I'm going to paint a picture for you. You are walking along the coast of France, specifically Brittany, it's a region of northwestern France. You're walking on the coast, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, and you look down at the edge of the water, and you see staring back at you the eyes of Garfield. <laughs> what? <laughs> wait, what? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> no, this is not a metaphor, this is a literal thing. It's probably the last thing I expected you to say. <laughs> specifically, what you are seeing is a novelty Garfield phone. It is basically shaped like Garfield. His eyes are closed, but apparently when they actually worked, when there was a call, his eyes would open, and they would close again once the call was done. The handset was, like, in his back. It was actually kind of weird. They're apparently a collector's item now. They sell for, like, 50 bucks on eBay. But since the 1980s, these phones or pieces of them have been washing up at the edge of this bay in northwestern France, and no one knew why. Like a lot of them? Yes. Uh, where, where's, the, where's the number? Uh, last year alone, 200 pieces were found. How many of these pieces were found on a Monday? Oh, that I don't know. I do not That's know. That's got... Who has not run that... How is that not the first analysis you run? That's an important stat. That is an important thing to find out. But they actually only... It's been a mystery since the 80s. And, and just no one's been able to figure out what's been, when, been happening. Wait, when did this happen? Oh, just like con- consistently since the 80s. Oh. Like, just, you know, apparently roughly 200 times a year, at least recently, <laughs> pieces of these phones have been washing up on the coast of France. Well, that's why I said you got to find out if it's more frequent on Mondays, because if it is, if there's a spike in frequency on specifically Mondays, then it's haunted. Then it's Garfield ghosts. If it's just flat... Then it means like some cargo ship that was carrying a bunch of, you know, Garfield phones crashed off the shore and nobody knew about it. It's funny you should say that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. It was not actually a cargo ship that crashed. But the reason this came back up recently, I actually heard about this at some point. I don't remember when it was. I heard about it back when, I mean, that was just, this is the kind of shit that happened, you know, will go wild on the internet is weird Garfield phone washing up all the time on coast of France. That's like internet catnip to use something appropriate, they actually just discovered what was actually happening. And what happened was there was a like cargo shipping container of these that fell off a boat back in the 80s in a storm and got lodged in a cave in this bay. It's just slowly been leaking them out. Yep. As time has gone on, there's just been this spreading like bit by bit more and more. How many are there? Because <laughs> over like 30 years or 40 years? Yeah. I mean, think about how big a shipping container is. I guess so. I mean, you if you make a production run of these, of, of anything plastic, you're doing like, you're in the thousands. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's reasonable. The mystery has been solved. The greatest mystery of our times. Did they find the shipping container? Yep, they found it. Oh. Are they going to bring it up so it stops, <laughs> they stop washing up? I mean, they actually didn't say that. All of, like the article I, I, the article that I read literally just ends with the guy saying the mystery is solved. We found our treasure, <laughs> which is one, a way to describe a crate full of Garfield phones. And two, not really <laughs> that descriptive of like <laughs> next steps. I mean, there really is no, not really too many next steps. You just go, you either ignore it or you just go and get them. So I guess it's not super interesting what comes after the, uh, the discovery of the Garfield treasures. Apparently, okay, so I actually found a different article on, on BBC, and apparently they're saying that it's, like, relatively buried. They can see, like, the orange plastic poking out from it, but it's buried to the point that because of, like, the way the cave is structured, you really can't get it out. Awesome. Although, wait, this article ends with a better line 
which is in the meantime both the guy who found them and local officials say they will continue to harvest garfields from the coastline which is <laughs> <laughs> this is one guy's job what i what i've seen in my mind is in the matrix when there's like the shot of all the human batteries like the you know the human farm I'm pretty much just seeing <laughs> that but it's all garfield <laughs> as far as the eye can see god uh, so yeah so that is that is a mystery that I'm sure you almost definitely did not know about that has now been solved. So I like that I found out about it and got closure immediately, unlike some other stupid mysteries. It's nice, right? It is nice. Yeah, I like just hand me things. Instant gratification. Can you imagine if you were a person who lived in one of these like coastal like French cities and you lived there your whole life and this all started when you were like six and you're now, you know, in your 40s and your entire life you've been seeing these fucking Garfield phones wash up? Okay, so... Here's the thing. It's not that big a mystery because I immediately was like, hey, something, the shipping container crashed and they're just there. True. <laughs> so it's the most, co- like Occam's Razor, it was the thing that everyone suspected it was. It's just hilarious that it's Garfield folks. What, what would you do if this was happening for 40 years straight for your whole life and then one day it just stopped? I don't know. That would be even more of a mystery. <laughs> yeah, that would be, yeah. That would be unsettling, I think. That'd scare me. Just, 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 just send offerings of lasagna out to sea in hopes that they come back. <laughs> <laughs> come back! No, global warming is taking up things away again. We angered it. <laughs> All right, so we have another mystery to solve, and that mystery is: what if every plant grew as fast as bamboo? I could tell you're you're working really hard on that segue. <laughs> yeah, so. Bamboo apparently grows super fast, and according to Guinness, it's the the fastest growing bamboo grows 35 inches per day, and we simplified and just said three feet per day. Yeah, so when we say every plant grows as fast as bamboo, it is every plant grows three feet, I guess, in its cardinal direction per day? Yeah, in whatever direction it's growing, it would grow normally. It just grows faster. And I specifically looked at grass. Because that would be very annoying if grass grew super fast. <laughs> yeah. Actually, can we before we get into it, can we stop for a second and f- just talk about how crazy it is that bamboo grows three feet in a fucking day? Yeah. It is pretty crazy. That's an inch every 40 minutes. Like, you can watch that, right? Like, you can watch bamboo get taller? Yeah. <laughs> in real time? Like, not even a time lapse? Yeah. Yep. It's kind of crazy. Wait, if people have, like, bamboo-like fences and shit in their backyard, do they cut it every day? It's probably not live bamboo i would assume yeah it's probably not planted in the ground (laughs) oh that makes a lot of sense (laughs) do do you is your wooden fence at home just like a bunch of trees that you out of the ground (laughs) no my my wooden fence at home is dead trees and you know they're cut into nice little picket planks Mm -hmm. yeah so i guess i see the analogy you're making now I thought you were like, is your bamboo fence at home, like, growing? (laughs) And I'm like, I don't have one. (laughs) Anyway, um, I covered grass, and technically, bamboo is actually a grass, which was really annoying when I was researching this, because I kept on searching, like, (laughs) fastest growing grass and longest grass, and bamboo just kept on showing up. (laughs) But, yeah, so we're saying that grass grows three feet per day, and normally grass grows around like two to six inches per week which i i average like four inches a week and healthy grass like the length of it is around three inches that's like the height you want to cut it at Mm -hmm. or cut it to um and most people cut their their lawns weekly to to satisfy that now in all the research that i was doing they kept on bringing up the one-third rule which i guess you're supposed to cut you're never supposed to cut more than one-third the height of a blade of grass uh, when you're cutting your lawn, which I never paid attention to that when I mowed my lawn, but I guess that's a thing. What happens if you don't? <laughs> um, if you don't, so if you cut more than that, it puts stress on the grass and it can like turn your, your lawn brown. It can like kill the grass or like make it more susceptible to z- diseases and stuff. I guess that makes sense. So that they want you to obey that one third rule. So in order to obey that and to to keep the three inch height of the grass, you have to cut it. You have to cut one point five inches when it reaches the four point five inches. Right. And in order to do that with our three feet per day growing grass, you have to cut it every hour. 
God, I hate cutting the grass. I, I don't even cut my grass the once a week it recommends. I cut my grass like once every other week, like if I'm lucky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you can usually get away with that. It's probably not the best for your lawn, but... I cut that shit to a quarter of its height. <laughs> Never mind, only a third off the top. <laughs> right, right. So if you want to keep a healthy lawn, I think the only option is... Um, I looked this up and you can get an automatic lawnmower. I actually didn't know these existed, but it's basically just a Roomba, but for your lawn. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> they need to make Roombas for more things. <laughs> yeah. It makes sense. Is it called is it called a Loomba? There are a bunch of them. I forget what they were called, but no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um Yeah, and you basically just have a bunch of these automatic lawnmowers cycling out so that you can like like charge them or I actually don't know if they run on electric or gas, but I yeah. think that usually what they do is they'll have like a base station they go back to. Where they both dump the clippings and also um, recharge. Well, the clippings I'll get to. <laughs> okay. Because, yeah, that was the first problem was, like, how often do you cut it? And we have a solution. We have automatic lawnmowers. The second problem is what to do with the grass clippings. Because you're obviously going to have a lot of grass clippings. <laughs> and normally, for just normal growing grass, it produces 300 pounds of grass clippings per thousand square feet per year. Most people used to bring their grass clippings to the dump and it would just get put into like landfills and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And landfills are running out of space and stuff like that's like a big problem with landfills. People have started giving other advice. They say don't do that. And Kansas actually bans bringing uh, like yard waste to landfills. But instead of bringing it to landfills, they say to just leave it in your lawn because it's 80% water and it decomposes within a few weeks. And it actually fertilizes your lawn, so it makes it healthy. And some people like recommend using it as mulch or like composting it. Uh, it's not really viable for us because we have so it's much of it. It's not viable for like a regular person either. Like, oh, just leave your grass, <laughs> leave leave a pile of gross ass grass for like three weeks on your lawn. As long as it's dry, then it's okay. If it's wet and heavy, then it like it weighs down your lawn and it makes like patches of your lawn die. So. Well, it's not even about, like, whether it goes away. It's about, like, I have a pile of just dry-ass dead grass, like, on my lawn. Well, usually what you do is you just leave, like, the bag off the mower and sort of let it go. Yeah. So it's distributed. So it, like, sprinkles throughout. Mm-hmm. I still have dying grass all over my fucking lawn. It's not <laughs> nice anymore. <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's, it's not fine. fine. It goes into the soil and it grows new grass. It just bl- blows in- into, like, Ted's lawn instead anyway. Fucking Ted. <laughs> Fuck Ted. Fuck Ted and his lawn Roombas. So with our with our new fast growing grass, instead of three hundred pounds, we have twenty seven thousand twenty seven hundred pounds per mm. thousand square feet per year. And the average lawn is about eight thousand square feet. Uh so we we're gonna have twenty one thousand pounds per year. And that means fifty nine pounds per day, uh, for like a normal lawn. That's a lot. That's a big number. Uh it's not we don't really have a simple solution. I guess we just like eliminate lawns <laughs> because they're too, they're way too much trouble. There's like, too much risk. You can pave, cover the world in concrete. Just pave over It'll them. It'll be yeah. beautiful. Or you could just use like Afro, AstroTurf. Artifact. If you wanted to look like grass, then you can do that. But yeah, we definitely don't want grass. <laughs> Unless you guys have a solution that you can think of. I couldn't think of anything. Um... Okay, so you have thir- six, 79 pounds of grass? 59. 59. 59 pounds of grass. Every day. How heavy do you think trebuchet rocks were? More than 59 pounds. It's, where are you going to trebuchet it to? Ted's fucking lawn. <laughs> Ted and his beautiful <laughs> lawn. He, he can handle it. He's out there all fucking day lowing, low, mowing his lawn and making my lawn look bad. <laughs> okay. Fucking yeah, you Ted. can do that. <laughs> Damn it, Ted. What would you do if your fucking neighbor trebuchet their <laughs> yard ways into your backyard? I think I'd be speechless. I would applaud personally. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would be impressive. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that w- that was my answer. Not really a solution, but anyway, Ben, what did you have? So, so I looked into farming because clearly things are going to kind of change here. Um, which sort of before I get into it, we kind of have an important question to answer, which I already answered. Because otherwise my answer goes extinct level pretty quickly. Um, if a crop grows to its full height, is it fully mature? 
Hmm. That's a, that's an excellent question, and I think I believe the answer is yes. I said yes because otherwise we're gonna have just no room for anything but large plants that don't actually give us that much food for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but when the, but harvest day, the cornucopia of goods, right? So, well, actually, I guess really the the problem is that we're gonna have. Basically, farming in that situation where it still takes just as long for plants to mature is plants are going to grow to their, like, mature height immediately and then just wait there for the normal length of time and then have, like, food on them. So farming won't actually change at all. It'll just be much more, like, of a tease, I guess. (laughs) So I went with not that version and the more fun one where everything matures very, very quickly. Yes. So under these rules, did, did you did you did you did you do your did you do your answer under the assumption that it grows to their full height and then stops? No, no, no. I did the other one. Oh well. So no. So <laughs> to a degree. So I'm gonna actually get to that because that does come up. So the fun thing about most of the plants that we like like um, harvest is that they are so like genetically modified just through, you know, centuries of breeding that they actually generally have some sort of like genetic predisposition predisposition to reach a certain height and then stop because it's just more convenient for picking. <laughs> so like as so a great example. Cool. Hmm? I said that's so fucking cool. Farming is cool. It is pretty cool. We're going to we're going to get to some fun exceptions in a second as well. <laughs> um so like for some fun like ideas of how long things take to grow. Um, I sort of assumed that for plants that have like a root system, that the root system is included in that growth rate as well, because otherwise certain plants are just super OP. (laughs) (laughs) So if you have, you know, like as an example, lettuce is my first example. A lettuce plant is only like six to 12 inches, but it also has a like 18 to 36 inch root system. If you didn't take that into account, lettuce is broken. (laughs) So (laughs) it still is pretty, pretty impressive, which is because you're going to, you know, it's going to be like 24 to 48 inches most of the time, which is going to be like a day and some change maybe to grow. But that's still, you know, that is at least a bit of a main factor. Let's get into something very fun, which is tomatoes. So tomatoes, there's actually two kinds of tomatoes. Uh, there's determinate tomatoes and indeterminate tomatoes. Determinate tomatoes are the ones where we have done that thing where we have genetically controlled them to grow in like bushes, basically, that grow like four feet tall and then stop. And then bear fruit very quickly. So those are going to grow in like a day and a half. Those are super boring. There's also, and you know, since I said there are determinate tomatoes, there are also, and I love this name, indeterminate tomatoes. <laughs> this seems like, like like a math problem that like the teachers are trying to make fun. It is. By like just changing the nouns. It is. It's not X anymore. It's tomato. Right. And, and really that's basically what this is. Because indeterminate tomatoes are genetically uncontrolled. And they basically just grow until their environment can't support them anymore. Um, the tallest one is about 65 feet tall. Oh. It was grown hydroponically by a company in the UK. I don't know, like, the breadth of that one. Um, but I do know that there is a tomato plant that's in the Guinness Book of World Records uh, from Japan that covers 920 square feet. So they're like bushes, right? So there's just like a giant bush. So these ones are actually full on trees. There actually are tomato trees as well oh. that grow up and then across, kind of. Think of like like a um like like a willow tree almost, but not dangly, obviously. Mm. And full of tomatoes. And full of tomatoes. Also for that nine hundred and twenty square feet, I realize that's kind of a weird thing to like wrap your head around because it's not a particularly like, you know, simple dimension. So I found a website that I cannot believe we had never found before doing this podcast called The Measure of Things. And what The Measure of Things does is that you put a dimension or weight or something in, and then it gives you comparisons. But I can tell you that 920 square feet is roughly a third of the size of a tennis court. So there's your comparison. Well, I'm happy I play tennis, and I can relate to that. There you go. So tomatoes, indeterminate tomatoes are actually kind of a problem because... They're going to grow really big, really fast. And I don't really have a solution to that aside from just like kill them. I don't know. <laughs> like I, they're actually like a threat. <laughs> How so, common are indeterm- indeterminate tomatoes? They're, they're less common. They are, you know, obviously like, you know, wild tomatoes or or they're not the ones we use for like crops because they take longer to grow because they are larger. Right. So, but they are kind of a problem, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> And then also there's corn. So corn is also kind of fun because corn can actually get very tall. Um, the record is around 45 feet. Whew. Wow. <laughs> uh, 
sort of the problem with corn though is that it doesn't actually help you much to have tall corn <laughs> it's actually very much a problem because at a certain point it stops being able to support itself and just collapses <laughs> so fortunately we do have breeds that that are you know capped at like eight or nine feet which are the ones that are generally you know grown for like sweet corn that we eat but you could get very tall ones so the tall ones don't have like a thicker base to support them nope that's kind of a flawed design <laughs> yep well i think it's one of those things where where you have to like breed them very specifically to grow tall and like have support for them so they don't yeah. just fall over um naturally it just wouldn't happen because if they grew too tall they would not you know survive so that whole evolution thing kind of takes care of it so on the surface this feels like a very good thing and for the most part it is world hunger is less of a problem because you know food is very easy to grow now um there are gonna be some problems uh the agricultural industry is actually gonna pretty much collapse i think because if you can grow crops in like two days (laughs) Uh, not only are a lot of people just going to grow their own crops or do like community gardens because a lot of the stress of that goes away when it has a much smaller time commitment. Yeah. When you can plant it on Monday and like harvest it for dinner. (laughs) Right. Exactly. (laughs) Um, but on top of that, just like, there's going to be such a huge supply compared to the relatively the same demand. So I think the price of all crops is going to just entirely collapse and the agricultural industry will, you know, die. So that's cool. But beyond that, we also have another problem. Um, which is bio waste, which I guess, Chris, you kind of also went into a little bit. Here I'm going to talk specifically about corn. And the other problem with tall corn is that aside from it not like living on its own, it doesn't actually really help you with regards to getting more corn. You just get taller corn. <laughs> <laughs> you get roughly the same amount of corn. It just is higher in the air. So even with these tall corn stocks, we're not actually making more food. We're just making more like stock. <laughs> And the stock isn't actually all that useful, at least with current technology. But, so because I was, my original hope was that we actually like use our biofuel or something. But right now we don't really. Oh. Uh, the problem is it's like the, the, so the starch is what you really convert into ethanol. Um, and it's like the actual grain of the corn that is high in starch. Uh, the stocks are low in starch, but high in cellulose. We are making technology to convert cellulose into ethanol. Um, It's being like piloted now, but it's still very much like super early and no one knows it'll actually be commercially feasible. But if it did happen, theoretically, we could just grow a shitload of really tall corn and convert all of that cellulose into biofuel and power like everything. Awesome. That's way more optimistic than mine. I actually <laughs> made a very optimistic answer for like the first time on this show. You saved the world in more than one way. Yep. So I guess that's how it turns out that farming um, collapses in the system, but everything's kind of okay. <laughs> so that's cool. awesome. I like it then. Yeah. The end. <laughs> <laughs> the end. Oh, wait, there's more. The epilogue <laughs> where everyone's happy. Yep. Um, so Marcus, is your is your uh, happy ending? Is this a happy ending or no? So the way the way I started looking at this was obviously all these plants. Like if you have a forest of all these plants, they're all competing for the same nutrients, sunlight, and water, and they can't all survive because they all need a whole bunch of nutrients to survive. And so my initial impressions was trees have a pretty strong advantage because um, as far as when they're growing, their primary dimension is up. So they'll be going straight up while all the vines and leafy ferns and shit are growing like, you know, kind of sideways and not straight up. So they're going to lose their sunlight as the trees get huge. Mm -hmm. Another interesting bit about trees is that their roots like extend outwards about 1.5 to 3 times the height of the tree. So if your tree goes 3 feet up, its roots go out like 6 feet in a day and, you know, mess with your, well, definitely your sidewalks, but also all the other plants and their systems because the roots are actually quite strong. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't really thinking about the roots when I was thinking this question, but it's a legitimate problem. They're kind of a problem. The other legitimate problem that Ben kind of mentioned is that after, like, when the corn gets too high, for example, it collapses on itself after a certain height. So there's actually, like, theoretical maxima for how tall plants can get and still survive. So for, like, you know, ferny and leafy plants, it's not high at all. They're not 
they don't have very good systems to structurally support themselves. The largest herbaceous plant, again, like on this leafy scale, is the banana plant, uh, Musa ingens, in New Guinea and Indonesia. It can get up to like 50 feet for its maximum height. But of course, they're all going to lose out in competition to trees, and trees just mechanically can grow up to about 450 feet before the water transportations in the trees um, break down and can't actually get it enough water for it to survive anymore. So when I was looking at this, now we kind of run into a problem. So if a tree, the, the tallest plant, assumedly, can only grow up to 450 feet before it dies, a tree can only live 150 days. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> Lots of plants have sexual reproduction cycles, which involve, you know, letting out seeds, them scattering, them getting fertilized, you know, the whole the birds and the bees thing going around. This is a problem. <laughs> so basically every plant is going to die before it can reproduce, except for non-sexually reproducing plants. And there are quite a few of those, but I honed in specifically on just one, which is water meal. Uh, water meal is that green stuff you sometimes see covering like a pond like if the surface is just like a flat green mm -hmm. um sometimes some, a lot of times you call it algae but it's not actually algae so it, it's actually a plant it is the smallest plant and it is a tiny floating plant that is one sixteenth inch long not anymore uh -oh. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> not anymore <laughs> you have just thousands and thousands of these things in a pond so let's zoom in and look at uh one pond, say, a 30-foot radius and covered in water meal. At 1 16th inch, if it's just one flat layer, there'd be about 720,000 water meal plants in the pond. If just those initial 720,000 grew um, to three feet after a day, they would cover an area of a quarter square mile. Mm. And so then my next question was, how many ponds are there uh, <laughs> that might be covered in water meal in the United States? And uh, I don't have a great answer, but thanks to the proceedings of the 8th Federal Interagency Sedimentation Conference, 8th, F F 8th FISC, held on April 2nd, 2006 in Reno, and their paper, Small Artificial Ponds in the United States Impacts on Sedimentation and Carbon Budget, there's an estimated, there's estimated between 2.6 and 9 million artificial ponds. So these are like the small ponds people will dig for their backyard. So this is not even count the natural occurring ponds. So this is going to be a very conservative number as I go forward. Um, and they said in some areas, the densities of how many ponds there are are exceeding 5 per kilometer squared, which is about 13 per square mile. So bringing it together a little bit, if one pond would cover an area of a quarter square mile after a day, if only four of your 13 ponds are covered in water meal, that whole pond dense area is already entirely covered in a three foot thick layer of water meal <laughs> after one day. Um, but hey, here's a fun fact, and why water meal tends to be a problem for ponds, is water meal populations can double in two days, and they reproduce asexually by budding. Huh. <laughs> so, zooming out from our individual pond to looking at the whole United States now, there are about, if you remember, there are two points, between 2.6 and 9 million ponds, so let's say 5 million. If you count 1 in 10 of those ponds being covered in water meal, in just three days, over a million square miles of land would be covered by water meal. By day five, it's five million square miles of land. Second fun fact, the United States is only 3.7 million square miles. <laughs> so by day five, we have covered more than the continental United States in That's water meal. Waiting for that comparison to the United States. <laughs> yep. And uh, going just a little step further, by day nine, so just a little over a week, We've covered the 57 million square miles that makes up the entire land area of the Earth. Okay. <laughs> and so, yeah, we're basically fucked. <laughs> Yay. We didn't kill all the plants this time. <laughs> we killed most well, of the plants, and then one of the plants thrived. Exactly. So, great for us, I guess. This is going to be a very strong and expanding problem. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, I felt I felt I just needed to end the Earth before we go into our middle of the podcast break. Yeah, no, no more of this Ben's positivity thing. I feel so lost. Usually, I'm the one who kills the Earth. Hey, everybody! Welcome to the sizzle in the middle with your man Marcus. We are going to talk about some good stuff, namely how you can help us. We help you by being hilarious and answering funny questions. Um, but you can help us by giving us funny questions to answer. 
So send us an email at absurdhypotheticals at gmail.com and we will answer your user question on our super fancy podcast. And you're going to listen to us say it and you'll be like, oh my god, I sent that in. And then we're going to tell you all the cool things we can do with it. And you're going to be like, oh man, I can't believe they thought of doing that. And we'll say your name if you want us to say your name. Yeah, and you're going to get that extra fame to all our dozens and dozens of listeners. And... It's just going to be a good time for everybody. Everybody wins. It's a win-win. Everybody win, wins. Win-win-win-win situation. And once we figure out who those other four parties are, they're going to be super on board. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on how many listeners we have, it's a win-win-win-win-win-win-win solution. <laughs> I said I said five wins, which means we have two listeners. <laughs> it's way more than that, Chris. Way more than that. Which means we should probably get on to the second part of our show before they get sick of listening to us um, talk about how few of them there are. <laughs> Welcome back, listener one and listener two, and maybe your friends if you've brought them with you. <laughs> we can dive right now into our second question, which is, what if you had a pet dinosaur? Ben, I'm going to let you start this one off. Sure. Uh, I don't have a plan on how to start this answer. <laughs> well, all right. So dinosaurs are cool. Um, I don't know if you know that. Dinosaurs are cool. <laughs> That's the thing that I learned only just now while researching this, this answer. I, I just, I, I just literally fucking hit the, my desk with my head, and I don't know if it came up in my audio. <laughs> I didn't hear it, so it's probably fine. <laughs> We're good at this. <laughs> so one particularly cool dinosaur that I actually did legitimately only learn about while researching this question, uh, which is the one that I certainly want as my pet, is the awesomely named. Dreadnoughtus. Yeah. <laughs> Which its name literally means fears nothing. <laughs> uh, it's one of a group of dinosaurs called Titanosaurs. Just cool names all the way down. Yeah, the one thing I learned about while researching this question was that the people that name the dinosaurs know that dinosaurs are cool. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely very true. Well, you have to think dinosaurs are really cool to be a paleontologist because I feel like Besides the subject matter being dinosaurs, it's not so much fun of a job. Right. This is this is pretty accurate, yeah. So you have to be pretty into the whole dinosaur thing to really go for it. So yeah, so titanosaurs... Titanosaurs are basically just like the largest land animals known to have existed, like, ever. Um, so apparently paleo bio, bio, well, paleobiologists actually don't really like the term titanosaurs. And they break it down into subgroups that actually have more in common aside from just being big. Uh, most of the time, but the Wikipedia article I looked at still called it a titanosaur, so I'm going to go with that for now. Um, but the Dreadnoughtus uh, was discovered in 2005 in Patagonia, in Argentina, and it, it so I'm just going to go and cut right to the chase, it is a big boy. So the one they found, uh, the, the estimated mass is about 42 tons, so slightly over 84,000 pounds, about 85 feet long. 37 feet of that is the neck. The legs alone were like six feet tall. It's a big dinosaur. It's kind of what I'm Jeez. getting at here. The legs sound, the legs actually sound kind of short, but I know that like if you look at a sauropod, the legs are pretty stubby compared right. to like... Yeah, the overall height of the dinosaur was roughly two stories. Yeah, there we go. Now we're back in dinosaur numbers. <laughs> so that's sort of your more, you know, that's probably a better way to think about it. But I'm going back to the measure of things because always fun just to give you some, you know, comparisons that length is just shorter than the distance between two bases on a baseball diamond so that gives you a pretty good idea tell me that you're tell me that the thing that you do with this dinosaur is teach it baseball it <laughs> i considered it I, I considered a few options and we'll get to that i was i was <laughs> i was hamstrung by one particular fact that couldn't let me get too specific unfortunately which i'll get to in a minute but uh the weight is about half as heavy as a space shuttle and roughly six times heavier than a T-Rex, to put it in dinosaur terms. And then the tail is slightly longer than one of those double-decker bus buses in London. Um, so, once again, just really, really big boy. And one of the really cool things about Grednatus is that by, like, the way the bones and the tail were structured, they could tell that the tail was actually, like, super, super muscular. It wasn't just, like, it wasn't just, like, used for balance or anything. They, as far as they can tell, it most likely actually use it for self-defense. It just, like, swept this, you know, like, 30-foot-long tail to, like, 
sweep away things that are trying to attack it. Oh, damn. Aside from just being big enough that things could, like, really not attack it. <laughs> it was it pretty much... They, they sort of assumed that it had really no actual predators just because nothing could really like do anything to it <laughs> yeah it's like it's like an elephant like what are you gonna fucking do to an elephant right <laughs> except that it was all ex- instead of being an elephant it was like approximately you know eight to ten elephants <laughs> just stacked on top just of each glued other glued together yep so we had this cool big dinosaur um and from there we sort of started asking what can we actually do with this cool big dinosaur and there are some options i did actually try to think about baseball because you have this large like I would assume at least somewhat navigatable tail that you could just like absolutely wall up a baseball with if you gave it several minutes to wind up. Um, but I didn't have any way to actually know exactly how strong the tail was. So I couldn't actually give any, you know, like numbers on anything. And how would like any other part of that sport work? <laughs> well, fortunately, it's long enough that, as I mentioned, it's roughly as long as the path between the bases. So it kind of just like lean its head down and touch the next base. <laughs> so that seems like a pretty good cheat code. <laughs> It would, it would be like kind of interesting baseball stats because it would just be like, you know, times at bat, whatever number, you know, singles and a thousand, just a hundred percent singles. Yep. You get a single and then you steal all of the bases. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> just lead, just lead two feet and you're there. Yep. So maybe a little, little OP for baseball on top of not actually getting good numbers for it. So my next thought was construction, but that's really boring. Like, yeah, you can like, I don't know smooth concrete with a tail it just is heavy and can like flatten things i don't know plus the flintstones did it already yeah flintstones did right, it right the flintstones did it so like it's a thing but like it's not all that great and honestly i feel like with this big you know this doesn't feel like a you know construction work. this is this is a a relaxation dinosaur in my opinion you know something this big and just sort of like not a care in the world because what can hurt it so it's not going to have that drive to like you know that sort of stuff this is a beach dinosaur. Think about it. You go to the beach. <laughs> it is tall enough that it is your umbrella. You got this, you know, like 90 foot, foot length that is pretty much a perfect water slide. Oh. Ooh, dino slide. And if you just like strap a fan onto that tail and just get it going, you're going to be cool all day. And covered in a giant wind of sand lots of lots of sand it's not there's gonna be some kinks to work out but all the pieces are there there is one other little thing as well oh actually the one thing that actually it could be legitimately pretty great at is actually uh search and rescue because like if something's like trapping someone it can like lift it with the tail and it just has like this giant you know neck that it can like reach into places so actual answer probably good at that but (laughs) that's less funny but it is that's, there. That's like the that's like the robotics answer too. Like yeah. if they don't know what a robot's actually going to be good for, they just made a cool robot. They're like, oh yeah, it would be great at search and rescue because the the, the legs I gave it to yep. be cool uh, could go over logs, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> um, one other cool thing that is sort of also a very real problem that I decided not to address. So this exact line appears in the Wikipedia entry. It, it mentions that it has a broad, unselective plant diet. Which, the thing that you have to point out here is that this is a, like, 40-ton herbivore. <laughs> so it kind of just eats every plant in front of it. <laughs> I don't really know how feeding this is going to work. Aside from probably not well. So if we had the three foot, uh, three foot per day growing plants, it would work. We have all of, the answer to all our problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but otherwise, that is kind of a problem I decided not to think about because I don't know... I couldn't actually find an exact amount. I mean, partially because they've only found this one and they can't really. Oh, also fun fact, all those sizes, I forgot to mention this um, because of like the way the bones were structured, they could tell this, this specimen was actually still growing when it died. (laughs) It wasn't fully grown yet. Oh my God. (laughs) So uh, it would probably actually be bigger at a certain point. So um, I don't know how you would possibly ever feed this. It still boggles the mind to me that, these things actually, you know, were able to feed themselves. Like, I know there was more plant life around at this point, but still, like, Jesus. The fact that something that's 40,000 tons could survive on just plants is absurd. Does it just, like, eat the tree, like, from the, like, just, like, just put its head all the way to the top and just go straight down to the bottom of the trunk and just, like, close the I mean, I think it probably (laughs) pretty much just, like, stripped branches clean. Like, 
No, my cartoony image of like it's snake, like like a snake just like swallowing a tree whole, and then it just like <laughs> like someone eating a chicken wing like the long way, and the then just way. point it out, and yeah, all the meat is off. Yeah, so they just they just put their head from the top of the tree, go all the way down, close their mouth, and go all the way up, and it's just like a clean trunk. Perfect. <laughs> uh, deforestation, another use for the uh, dreadnoughtus. It does sound like a deforestation tool. Like if I made a really cool uh, tree cutter downer. Uh, Dreadnoughtus would be an apt name for it. That is a very good point. Anyway, that's my fun pet dinosaur. It's a big boy. Marcus, what was your pet dinosaur? So I actually switched uh, halfway through my research. So um, my initial choice, kind of going along the same lines as you, Ben, um, was the Gigantoraptor. Ooh, <laughs> another awesome name. Which is not as quite as cool as it sounds. Oh. No. So physical description, <laughs> um, take a T-Rex. Now, remove all the defining features of the T-Rex, except for its general shape and size. Mm. Now, take all those features that you removed and replace them all with chicken bits. What? (laughs) This dinosaur was basically a 26-foot chicken. It had a beak. It had, like, little wings, like, for where the T-Rex arms. It had, like, you know, that, um, where, like, the feathers are hanging down from the bottom of the the arms. Mm Mm-hmm. It had like a feathered tail and it the whole head shape was just chicken. But worryingly, this is one of those dinosaurs where they actually don't know if it had feathers or not. And it's one where I wish it did. <laughs> I don't want a 26 foot naked chicken yeah, um, that's worse. to be walking around. The, the videos and renderings of it without feathers are not um, very beautiful. The problem is they actually don't know too much about this thing because it doesn't actually fit the... Mo- like the evolution mold that they had like established so it's kind of like an outlier so they're not sure about a lot of its behavior and things so when i was trying to look for you know interesting facts about it the i, I stopped my research at this quote from dr jing Zhu from the chinese academy of sciences in beijing where he concluded with gigantoraptor is remarkable in its gigantic size <laughs> <laughs> And so I was like, man, this really just nothing except just a big chicken, huh? And so I was trying to figure out what I could do with the big chicken. And then I realized I was being a big fucking doofus and I was missing the obvious and glorious answer to this question. And the answer is a member of the Asdarkidae family, the Quetzalcoatlus. Ooh. Quetzalcoatlus is the largest flying animal. It has it weighs between 450 550 pounds and a wingspan between 35 and 50 feet, which is actually the range that uh, for my research is bigger. They just have to fucking guess at how big the wings are after a certain <laughs> point because the bones only go so far. But not only does it have a really long wingspan, it also has a really long neck. So it's act- its height's actually also pretty close to that same 35 50 foot number. So, so it's like a Nazgul. <laughs> yeah, so physical description um Start with a giraffe instead of a T-Rex this time. Okay. Um, you can get rid of the, get rid of the stupid spots, um, or don't. I mean, we don't really know what they look. You know what the what the skin look like. So you have your giraffe. Now arch the back slightly backward so that the front legs are a bit longer than the back legs, but not too much. It, it could walk around on four legs. Uh, now extend the front legs into wings and let those connect to like the top half of the back legs. Um, now go to the giraffe head. Uh, Take away the giraffe head and add a super long skull and beak, like maybe three quarters the length of the neck. Oh, God. And so now you have your um, you have your Quetzalcoatlus. I'm imagining something super doofy. It is super doofy looking. <laughs> <laughs> but in a way I found endearing. Um, this is also just going forward. And so I don't say Quetzalcoatlus so many times because I'm just going to get it wrong like 30% of the time. It's in the pterodactyl family. So I'm just going to call it a pterodactyl. Well, it looks a little different than... You. How, do you, how, do you, how do you spell it in case people want to look up what it looks like? The spelling is Q-U-E-T-Z-A-L-C-O-A-T-L-U-S. I'm assuming it's named after the... It's like a god, right? Um, yeah, the Mayan... Um, the the Mayan snake god, Quetzalcoatl. There it is. That's the one. Mm. Mesoamerican? I had it written down. Fuck, where'd it go? Notes, tell me where it is. <laughs> I'm Googling it. I was going to Google it, but then I, I wasn't typing it in as you were spelling it, so I forgot the spelling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's exactly that god's name with just the dinosaurian U.S. added to the end. So going along the lines of what Ben mentioned, uh, his problem about what they eat. So what's fun is that they originally thought that these were like vultures where they would be scavengers and they would eat basically whatever they could find. 
But along the line, other paleontologists pointed out that the beak was just all wrong, and that based on the beak shape, they likely fed on, fed like modern skimming birds, were the ones that'll fly by the ocean, Mm -hmm. or big lakes, and they'll catch fish like in flight, or they'll cut the surface with the beak and, you know, get them just below the water surface. Um, And now, to quote Wikipedia, while this skim feeding view became widely accepted, it was not subjected to scientific research until 2007, when a study showed that for large pterosaurs, it was not a viable method, because the energy cost would be too high due to excessive drag. Now, what I think this is actually saying in science words is, if this big-ass bird put its beak in the water, it would just not, it would just stop and flip over. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Energy cost too high to excessive drag means it's going to fucking face plant into the ocean. <laughs> Additionally, um, a year later in 2008, they did another study that concluded, oh, wait, they don't live anywhere near the water anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so all of that was irrelevant. So what they eventually concluded is that the pterodactyl hunted small vertebrates on land or in small trees, which is kind of terrifying to me because if they're hunting on the land, they're not actually like swooping down and like getting things that way it's gonna run at you and based on the way this thing looks i would much prefer it to fly at me than run at me (laughs) it's just all the it has all the wrong like limb shapes for it to (laughs) to be uh pleasant to get run down by (laughs) that brings us to the ultimate question of course which is could you ride one could you ride one of these things according to our paleontologist friends at pterosaur.net blog the answer is hell yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so they actually they actually went and they did a whole bunch of uh research and math very much like our podcast and they really were basically our podcast because they answered other pressing questions like would they be a good food source if you raised them in a farm <laughs> uh answer to that one is no but the answer to them flying is yes so anyway they'd have no issue taking off and flying for a few minutes which is awesome but there's a couple caveats Uh, First, they'd get tired fairly quickly, so they'd have to switch to, like, a gliding pattern. Um, And so in order for them to maintain that, if you're going to go, like, a longer distance, they'd have to, you know, catch the thermals and use those to glide um, farther and farther along. Which leads to a small problem, because birds are good at flying really, really high because they have a resistance to hypoxia, um, which is, you know, the, the, the temperatures and lower oxygen in the atmosphere messing with your brain. The highest soaring birds can actually go up over 30,000 feet up in the air, which is just like stupid high numbers. But even like little birds, like sparrows, are just fine at 15,000 feet. Typical mammals are less fine, as the research puts it, generally uh, comatose at that height. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And unfortunately, you have to be up like, you know, at these heights in order to catch, you know, to find and catch these thermals in in a stable gliding pattern. So obviously there's two potential issues. Um, one is you. You going comatose is not going to be in your best interest because you'll probably just be dead by the time you land. There's a fairly easy fix in that you can basically just get an oxygen mask and a big coat and you'd be more or less fine for you know if you're not up there for too long. The second potential issue is your pet Quetzalcoatlus because um, genetically he's in between the mammal and bird spectrum. So he's not necessarily um, cool with being up that high with that little oxygen and warmth. It's basically the same fix, except it would involve having a very confused tailor make a coat for your giant bird. <laughs> and I don't know exactly where you'd find an oxygen manufacturer to get an oxygen mask for your um, giant bird, but that's going to be definitely some heavy Googling. Yeah, especially how big its head is. Yeah, like it's you a need a giant like, head. You probably need like a five, like a five or ten gallon drum that you convert into an oxygen mask somehow. But it's like it's kind of a coin flip what the what the anatomy is whether it would just be fine on its own. Hopefully it is. But I I wouldn't mind getting uh my cool dinosaur pet a cool coat. You can just have the exterior of an airplane, but instead of wings, it'll be his wings. <laughs> You're just holes coming out. <laughs> yeah, holes of the wings coming out. Yeah. <laughs> it would have to be backwards because the way this thing is shaped, it's like. A fighter jet, but like backwards, where the wings, like the big wings, are like in the back, and the long skinny part just goes all the way out to the front. They have like a couple like images of it next side by side to next like a to like a fighter jet, like the silhouettes, and it's basically just one but back, but like facing backwards. Second caveat on on taking long trips with your um, pterodactyl is that you can't fly right after he eats because um, they 
tended to land and, you know, walk around and eat and hunt and all that. And after they eat, then he has a big bully, he has a big belly full of food, which is not great for flying. So you're going to have to wait for him to um, digest and poop it out. However, based on his skull and whatever they can find out about his brain, he's going to be more or less like a bird in that respect, in that respect, and that he'll evolve to get rid of that food as quickly as possible in a, quote, form of acidic paste that is common to all archosaurs. What? <laughs> um, archosaurs covering all birds, reptiles, um, and pterodactyls and dinosaurs that evolved, you know, they evolved from. So it's basically just bird poop. <laughs> okay. When he said acidic paste, I was getting a little bit nervous. <laughs> yeah, this, the, 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 it made sense in context because the sentence that immediately followed it was, this paste can be damaged to architecture and car paint. Ah, uh, I get it now. <laughs> I see. So you may not be the most popular uh, fellow in the neighborhood. One, because everyone's going to be super jealous of your pet dinosaur. And two, if your pet dinosaur takes a dump on like <laughs> their family car, I think it just like dissolves the roof off. Right. <laughs> I mean, Todd did say he always wanted a convertible. It's fucking Todd. <laughs> Todd. Was it Todd or Ted? I think it was uh, Ted. Was it Ted? <laughs> Whatever. I don't care. I'm, I'm calling it the wrong name. To Yeah, exactly. It's his brother fucking, Todd. Fucking Ted and his life partner Todd. Yeah. Todd and his fucking convertibles and Ted and his backyard maintenance. So then I wrote down, the next thing I wrote down is, what do I do with it? And I was trying to think of a job that, you know, would be made better by having a flying dinosaur pet that you could ride. And then I tried to find a specific job that wouldn't be better because all everything I could think of, I'm like, no, it's just awesome and better all the time. So <laughs> what do you do with it? You ride it. You ride it to work. You ride it to school. You ride it to your friend's place. You ride it to the bar. Just the conclusion is that this pet, pet dinosaur is the best because it makes everything better. Yeah, that seems reasonable. Yeah, I don't think there's any particular job. Like, you could be a delivery person, but like it just kind of didn't, it didn't resonate with me. Work for Amazon. Yeah, but like... You, you're one in a mil. Like delivery is like you make such a small impact as the one dinosaur delivery man. What if yeah, you it'll be around, like a, a, It'll be a benefit of Prime. You'll get the dinosaur delivery. Like one state, like one city would. <laughs> you're two. You're just one man, Chris. You can't fix Amazon. Ooh, you could do flyovers like the Blue Angels, for like sporting events. Oh uh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's cool. But that's just that just falls under the. It's cool to fly in a dinosaur category. Well, yeah, but you can make money doing it that way. <laughs> You're going to be able to make money on it if you try even a little bit. Okay, fair enough. So, what do you do with it? Whatever the fuck you want. You have a flying dinosaur. <laughs> Chris, what did you do? So, the dinosaur I picked is called the Therizino... No. It's called the Therizinosaur. Yes, I got that so right. So, worse than my dinosaur. Therizinosaur. And it means scythe lizard. Ooh. That is a cool name. Yeah. <laughs> So it lived in the late Cretaceous period, um, and they actually found the first fossil in 1948 in Mongolia. And the fossil is actually incomplete, so the knowledge of it is kind of limited, but they're able to like, piece together like bits and pieces of it. Um, so they, they know that it's bipedal, and they estimate that it's 33 feet long and weighs about 5 t- tons. And then... The distinguishing feature of it is actually its claws. It has three foot long claws, which is what? Jesus. yes, <laughs> it's the longest claw of any animal. Uh, so it has three claws on each li- on each arm, and they're all three feet long. So this is like a fucking Freddy looking dinosaur. Yeah, <laughs> and they're for the most part they're straight. I think they like taper a little bit at the end, but. Well, every purpose. animal gets to, every animal's a little bit homosexual, like you know, percentage wise. I couldn't decide if I was going to make a joke about that, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you set up for that, Marcus. Marcus made the decision for you. Um, they never f- actually found its skull, so they don't really know what its diet was. But based on other similar dinosaurs, it's most likely an herbivore, which is surprising because of the giant claws. You'd think that it would use the claws to like kill prey. Um, yeah, exactly. It's got like, um, oh my god, what are the barbecue things called? Kebabs. It's it's a kebabosaur. Yeah, <laughs> kebabosaur. Um, they hypothesized that the use of the claws was actually to like pull down trees so that they could just like grab the branches um, mm. to eat off of those. Oh, that makes sense. We just have like a you just like strip it that way. Yeah, and there's they just, also like, our pruning shears. Yeah. And there's also a theory that um, 
because they were found in Mongolia and it was kind of the same area as um, the Tyrannosaurus Rex was. So they have a theory that it was to fend off the T-Rex. Mm. They could use them to fend off the T-Rex, which would be pretty awesome. Giant claws versus T-Rex. Yeah. Do you, how robbed do you feel as an evolving species if your um, time and location overlap with the fucking Tyrannosaurus Rex? <laughs> It's like, come on, guys, this isn't fair. Look at this fucking thing. Especially if you're an herbivore. Yeah, it's like four school buses filled with teeth. <laughs> so, yeah, my my knowledge of this dinosaur is pretty limited, so that's basically all I know about this dinosaur. Um, but the claws were were good enough. I could go off of that. So what can I go? What can I do with these three foot claws? I, I look for inspiration in other things that had claws. So. Marcus brought up Freddy Krueger. Uh, so I was like, what What does he use? Because he has the glove with the claws on it. He was like, what does he do with the claws? He kills people. <laughs> <laughs> Not great for me. You have to look that one up, did you? <laughs> I don't really want to kill people with my claw dinosaur. So I was like, uh, well, Freddy Krueger is a villain. What if we have a hero? A hero that has claws. Wolverine. What does he do with his claws? He kills people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm noticing a theme here. <laughs> I was like, okay, another person that has sort of claws is Edward Scissorhands. He has scissors, but they're similar to claws. And in Edward Scissorhands, the movie, he uses his scissors to cut hedges, which claws cannot do. Mm, So (laughs) close. He grooms dogs, which claws cannot do. He cuts hair, which mostly cutting stuff, (laughs) which claws cannot do. And then at the end, he kills someone. So, <laughs> <laughs> so conclusion, claws are good at killing people. <laughs> this is the uh, hard research that only we can do. <laughs> yeah, this is, this, is what, this is what our engineering degrees have wrought. Yeah. So my inspiration didn't really, or my, uh, my sources of inspiration didn't really help me at all. So I kind of had to come up with something on my own. And... I didn't want to kill things, so um, I started to try to think of like other non-violent pokey things. <laughs> They're fondue sticks, so we could maybe have like fondue claws, but I, I think the claws are actually too thick for that. You wouldn't really be able to fit that much on it, and I don't know what that would even mean. Like, I open a restaurant and there's a dinosaur with fondue fingers. <laughs> If you have like big steaks, like a, like a barbecue place, big steaks and, and a big hot pot in the middle. I was seeing like a rotisserie chicken. But then he'd have to keep on rotating his arm. Yeah, that's not great. <laughs> I did think of like a shawarma type place, but. Yeah. Yeah. Another nonviolent pokey thing, fire pokers. You could just have him poke fires. <laughs> Don't know if you need to like have a thing specifically for that. <laughs> <laughs> Like a stick suffices. Yeah. Technically. <laughs> but his claws work too, if you want to use his claws. And then the most practical thing I came up with is it's probably my answer that I'm gonna go with. Is uh so he is like basically the high size of a house and he's bipedal. And the thing about him is that instead of Most other bipedal dinosaurs, he doesn't have tiny arms. (laughs) Mm. He actually has, like, useful limbs, and he stands on two feet. So he can, like, reach roofs on houses and stuff, and he can, like, reach the gutters. So I think he can use his claws to clean the gutters of houses. Yeah, I like it. And then, at least here in Boston, uh, like, a couple years ago, we had a, a big snowstorm, and, like, everyone is having trouble with their roofs. Uh, like the, the weight of the snow on their roofs and they're like snow removal services for your roof so he could just like scrape the snow off your roof hmm. make a giant snowball and throw it somewhere else into like ted or todd's yard yeah ted, t- fucking ted and todd <laughs> that fucking kid tim always throwing snowballs <laughs> this will show him so yeah that's that's basically my answer is a gutter cleaning service and snow removal roof service for this how did you not what? Chris, how does your brain work that you did not take this as wish fulfillment? Like, Ben's like, biggest dinosaur ever. I'm going to have a fucking beach day water slide dinosaur party. 
I'm like, biggest flying dinosaur ever. I'm going to fly it around in the air. It's going to be awesome. And you're like, I'm going to just get, like, this dorky guy and open a small suburban business. <laughs> like, we no gunners. It's not even just a dorky guy. It's, I'm going to get this dinosaur with three in, or three foot long claws <laughs> and open a gutter cleaning service. I mean, I... I picked the dinosaur based on its claws because I thought the claws are cool. And then I realized you can't really do anything with claws other than kill people. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Yeah, well, I, that's why I bedded my Gigantoraptor chicken dinosaur. Because <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, I don't fucking want this. Oh, man. So, yeah, that's all I had. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's enough. It's enough. <laughs> I love it. It's it's very apt. Somehow, somehow it suits you. But, uh... Next week we're gonna go back. To, we're gonna go into the past next week. Not quite as far as the dinosaurs, but we're gonna go back to 1995, and we're gonna answer the following questions: Which cartoon character would win in a fight? And what if Pokemon existed? 